D Hop, happy as hell to go. This has been in his head for a couple of weeks now. He goes from has. he goes from going to bed with Mason Rudolph and Will Levis to waking up yeah. to having Patrick Mahomes and a chance to get a ring. Welcome to the NFL on Fox podcast presented by Verizon, the NFL powered by Verizon 5G. I am your host, Dave Hellman. Welcome to the week eight preview. Great slate of games to talk about this week. Just a lot of action in general, as if we didn't have games to preview. The Kansas City Chiefs traded for an all pro wide receiver on Wednesday. We got all of that to talk about. Greg Olson will be joining the show later on to preview his game this week. It is a rematch between the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Atlanta Falcons. Hopefully it's half as entertaining as the first edition of that on Thursday night a few weeks ago. Speaking of Thursday night, I think a just an under-the-radar great Thursday night game tonight as the Minnesota Vikings travel out here to L.A. to take on the Los Angeles Rams. Did I mention... Tom Brady's going up to the Pacific Northwest for Bill's Seahawks. Cowboys 49ers renew their rivalry on Sunday night football. Yeah, it's a fantastic slate. We're going to get into all that. We're actually going to cover all of that ground, starting with the DeAndre Hopkins trade with our guy, Peter Schrager, who joined us as he always does. Check it out. Well, Peter, I just absolutely love it when the league makes our jobs easier, man. And I, I, I'd love to talk to you about this because you do daily morning TV and, you know, you you got your rundown all ready to go. You, you know, or you thought, you know, what you're going to talk about. And then, like, as everything's firing up this morning, word comes down that the Kansas City Chiefs have traded for DeAndre Hopkins. What 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 did you know at the time? How did it change your morning? How do you think it changes yeah. the outlook for the Chiefs? Let's go inside baseball, uh, break the fourth wall on on how you do a morning show when you get it's my news favorite. At, yeah, at do it. six a.m. Eastern, that there's a trade coming through, and I got it initially from a text. Then Schefter tweeted like seconds later, so he must have gotten at the same time. We're the only two nutballs who are up at that time that the Hopkins deal is going to be going through. Um, we originally had an A block, which is the first segment of the show dedicated to you know, still fresh off this, this Ravens win and the way that the Chiefs won. Are the Ravens now the best team in the AFC despite the records? And I think that's still a good conversation to have. I think that's a sure. great way to start it. And it's a great way to lean into week seven as we go. We threw that out the window. Here's how the Hopkins deal went down. It's been in the works for a couple of weeks now where the two teams have been kind of dancing with each other on whether it's a possibility. Last night around midnight, it really heated up and they were working the, the phones until the early hours and 6 a.m. they came to the terms that it's going to be. So it's DeAndre Hopkins for a fifth round pick. That fifth round pick can become a fourth round pick, but that's going to be based on playing time and whether or not the Chiefs make the Super Bowl as incentive. Oh. So I, that hasn't been finalized yet, but I know that's where they were at as of the recording of this podcast. Um, and really the truth of the matter was they were not going to go go wild for a wide receiver unless they felt they absolutely had to. And they were you know, considering stuff around week two, week three, and Brett Veach is always good at adding guys. And when they lost Rasheed Rice, it looked like it might be the time. They kind of held off based on the compensation that some of these bigger name wide receivers were going for. So Hopkins' name came up, and they got it to this point. And when Juju went down, which is not a name anyone's really thinking about when you think of the Chiefs offense, you think of Pacheco and Rice and even Hollywood Brown. But Juju had developed into their go-to red zone target and their possession guy, and he had eight catches the last time they were on the field before Sunday, and then he goes down with a hamstring injury. Felt like there was an urgency, so they get it done. D-Hop, happy as hell to go. This has been in his head for a couple of weeks now. He goes from has. he goes from going to bed with Mason Rudolph and Will Levis to waking up yeah. to having Patrick Mahomes and a chance to get a ring. So everyone's happy with the deal, including Tennessee, who I'm told had nothing bad to say, and this comes from the sources I have in Tennessee, they have nothing bad to say about Hopkins. Like, he was a good veteran there. 
they enjoyed his time. And I think the owner really took to him. He's actually heavily invested in Nashville. Like he's put a lot of money into like real estate into some other companies. Interesting guy, DeAndre Hopkins. He's not a one dimensional person. He's not just an athlete. Um, so he leaves Nashville for uh, you know a cup of coffee here with the with the Chiefs, and we'll see if he can get a Super Bowl ring. I love when a team recognizes what it is for good and for bad. I mean, we know the Chiefs are always down to recognize, like, hey, we got a sh- we got a shot to be in the Super Bowl every year that yeah. fifteen is here. So let's go for it. But also, I mean, look, Tennessee brought all these guys in to try to evaluate their quarterback. It's it's not going so hot. DeAndre Hopkins is 32 years old. Like whatever the future holds for the Titans in the long term, DeAndre Hopkins probably isn't part of it. So to get a, a decent pick for him. And on top of that, I love that little tidbit about condition because for 31 teams, that is a pie in the sky condition for the Kansas city chiefs. The Titans have plenty of reason for optimism that they might meet that. Yeah, and that's the coolest deal that they have the, uh, I guess you'd almost say the bravado to say, how about that being an incentive? And then everyone being like, yeah, that makes sense. And then now you have the Titans now rooting for the Chiefs to get to the Super Bowl, which is also fun. Um, They went out and they signed Calvin Ridley. Like They sent big money on Calvin Ridley. They've got, of course, Traylon Burke still there. And then... You know, they spent on on Tony Pollard. So, like, they had expectations of being a real player here, but it hasn't happened for Tennessee, not in year one of Brian Callahan's uh, tenure, and they figured they're not going to the Super Bowl, so let's let's get something for DeAndre Hopkins while we still can. I'm borrowing this from Nick Wright, our colleague, so all yeah, credit to him. I like but Nick. I loved his line this morning that was essentially, the Chiefs have made it a an annual tradition to save a receiver from a bad situation. It was... Kadarius Tony a couple years ago. Yep. It was Miko bringing Miko Hardman back Heck. last year, and and these guys are making huge plays in Super Bowls. By the way, so go ahead and pencil it in. If the Chiefs make it back to the Super Bowl, I'm sure DeAndre Hopkins will will go. There's off something if they cool get to, to this game. too. They courted DeAndre heavily in 2023, so they went up and won the Super Bowl last year. But before last year, they were really invested, and then he signed with the Titans. That happens, whatever. They have this like open door policy almost where just because it doesn't work doesn't mean there's not going to be another opportunity. You know, Juju was with the Chiefs. He goes for the Patriots, gets cut by the Patriots. There's a door. Come on back. Kareem Hunt seems like his career was over after the Cleveland, uh, you know, a couple of years he was there and bounced around. And it's like, come on back. Mikal Hardman was a disaster with the Jets. He had the game-winning Super Bowl catch last year. And then another guy, Jody Fortson, who was always like that third tight end that they love using in certain packages. He was elsewhere. He comes back. So, like, whether it be Frank Clark or whether it be all these other guys, Charles O'Meni, who, like, there's a long tradition of the Chiefs saying, just because it didn't work out this time doesn't mean that the door is not open. And in this case, Hopkins never played for the Chiefs, but they courted him pretty heavily, and he didn't end up there. And instead of being like, screw him, close the door, Go enjoy Tennessee. They're like, no, we'll just get you for the right price. And they do a couple years later. Eerily reminiscent of Tom Brady's teams in both New England and Tampa, honestly. The way like star players want to play there, you have a habit of bringing guys back into the fold uh, when you get the opportunity. Surprise, surprise. When you have no doubt a better, a better chance than everybody at reaching the Super Bowl, who wouldn't want to go there? I did. Okay. Obviously, a, a major trade for a name player like Hopkins is going to dominate the headlines for the next couple days. I did. I wanted to talk to you about chiefs Raiders anyway, something you wrote in your cheat sheet cheat sheet for this week. And it's a conversation that's been popping up for, I mean, most all of this season and some of last, but Steve Spagnuolo. And and even if Deandre Hopkins is a grand slam, Mm -hmm. I still think you got to recognize the identity of this chiefs team is firmly on that side of the ball. And I, I thought you made an interesting point about, if there's going to be a year where Spagnolo gets another look at a head coaching opportunity, I mean, if it's going to happen, it's got to be after this year, right? Well, I appreciate you reading the article and it's something I'm passionate about. And it's, you know, we have all these young Turks that are coaching and whether it be Gerard Mayo or Brian Callahan or you name it, guys that, okay, wow, you're going to hire that guy. Um, 
Steve Spagnuolo has not gotten an interview for head coaching job in recent years. I think the assumption around the league and in the media is like that. Why would he ever leave? He's happy. He's, he's already done it. Didn't work out. He's a great coordinator. He might be one of the best coordinators of all time, but I know Spags well. I think he would love to interview for another head coaching job. And I think he would love the opportunity to do so. He wouldn't admit it publicly. And he certainly is saying all the right things. I mean, I'm sure he would read my article and say, I'm only worried about the Las Vegas Raiders. Can we not even talk about that opportunity? Course. Truth of the matter is, 10 and 38 as a head coach, one of the worst winning percentages of all time, and then had one of the worst defenses of all time with the Saints. Wasn't great with the Giants the second time around after being the Giants defensive coordinator the first time around and the Eagles before that. But then the last few years has become this defensive mastermind and, and has this incredible unit. And what I love about the Chiefs defense, they lose guys. Like, Legereus Sneed took big money from the Titans, and Willie Gay took big money from the Saints. Like, and they don't miss a beat. They just find new guys. So they had two rookies who made big plays, two interceptions in the game on Sunday. And, you know, it's Chamari Connor and Brian Cook as opposed to the Honey Badger and, you know, Daniel Sorensen, who are the guys from the first, you know, couple Super Bowl runs. So I, I, I think Spags is an unbelievable coach. He's an unbelievable leader of men. And in our quest to crown Ben Johnson and uh, Bobby Slowick and all these other young offensive coaches – I just wanted to put it out there that maybe a team should at least interview the greatest defensive coordinator in the sport and maybe give him an opportunity to maybe see if he wants to be a head coach before we just assume that he's 64 years old and likes eating his, his wife's chicken Parmesan. Very deservedly. Like we're having this conversation these days about how maybe, maybe it's the situation that helps a quarterback succeed more so than his own talent level. And we're seeing all these quarterbacks get these new, you know, bursts of life. I, I think you could make the same point for, for a head coach. I mean, you mentioned it in the article, like those Rams teams right before they left for LA, like up until Sean McVay, were just churning through head coaches. You've seen that for a, a variety of teams around the league where it's like, hey, I mean, at the end of the day, I guess your record is what it, what it you know, you are what your record says you are. But there are clearly some situations in the NFL that are conducive to success as opposed to some that, you just have a, a very steep hill to climb the moment you get there. Absolutely. It's like almost like an incubator. And you you know the famous, you know, Packers of the 90s when it was Mariucci and Reed and Holmgren. And then, of course, the Redskins of the early 2010s when it was LaFleur and McDaniel and Raheem Morris and McVay and the Shanahan. Like, there are those places. And oddly enough, the Chiefs, it's been Nagy and Spags the past few years, and Biennemi obviously you know, took other role and went on and pursued something else. But like, for the most part, they retain their coaching staff, and they might have new players, but those Chiefs teams, they bring back all the same guys on the coaching staff, and they continue to win and just keep on rolling. All right, this is what I wanted to lead with before DeAndre Hopkins. He messed up my rundown, too. I mean, I That's wasn't okay. up at... I wasn't up at 6 a.m. Eastern. All right, that was but... me flexing. I'm so important. No, it's good. Doesn't matter. East, East Coast is just crazy to me. I mean, it just feels like another. West Coast is crazy to me. You guys, I'm watching. I was there on Sunday night. I'm watching the Jets and the Mets, and it's still sunny out, and it's nighttime games. I had no idea. I'm like, I don't know how you guys do this. It's unbelievable. It's right? rough in the mo it's rough in the mornings, but really good in the evenings. Is don't what worry. I you missed you missed Jaguars Patriots. I think you'll be all right. <laughs> it's. It's totally fair. and don't worry panthers panthers giants is in munich in a couple of weeks i think you'll be all right i think i'm gonna sleep i'm gonna sleep through that one all right <laughs> no right. I, I'll, I'll fill you in i wanted to talk to you about thursday night football which might seem like a weird place to start but man this is this is such a sneaky good game with the minnesota vikings coming out here you talked about it in your article about how you know even with an ugly win against the Raiders the Rams are kind of keeping their season afloat but on top of the Rams just sort of sneakily hanging around hoping to get healthy I love the relationships in this matchup uh, you know Kevin O'Connell coming back to LA to go against McVay and Matthew Stafford Brian Flores is the guy that beat McVay in a Super Bowl and kind of used that as a launching pad to kickstart his career I just I love so many of the little intricacies of this game. I think it's it's a lot better than than what the records might indicate. Oh, it's so deep. It's so deep. There's you know, you mentioned O'Connell. O'Connell and Stafford basically were, you know, during 
during that time in, in Stafford's career, like they, they immediately linked up and it was the first year. And it was like, I need to learn this offense. I need to get it going. And O'Connell became like Stafford's right-hand man. The two of them had this incredible run and they win the Super Bowl. Then of course, O'Connell gets opportunities thereafter. But you mentioned Flores. You know, I talked to McVay quite a bit and, and he will always say that like he regrets that Super Bowl because Belichick and Flores got the best of him. And no matter how hard he prepared, he felt like he could have done even more in hindsight. And I think that loss really queued up the game plan for the Cincinnati Super Bowl where they won because he felt like he was out coached in a lot of ways in the game planning and wasn't prepared for it. I think that loss still sits with him today. And here comes Flores with a different group of guys, but that same coach. Now, this goes lost in the history of time because Flores is, you know, was with the Dolphins and then sued the league and all this stuff. When they beat the, they were in Atlanta and Flores was the defensive coordinator, but not in title, but was the DC of that Patriots team. They beat the Rams. Flores, instead of driving back with the team, instead of getting on the team bus, Flores walked from Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta, walked with his family back to the team hotel, and he did it amidst all these Patriots fans, knowing it was his last days as a Patriot. So, like, there's this cool, like, he's got a history with McVay, yeah. and it's pretty neat that they're going up against each other here. And then, of course, the looming stuff is the Cooper Cup rumors. Cup and, and Kevin O'Connell, very tight as well. He's the head coach of the Vikings. Um, I would just say this. They're not trading Cooper Cup if they win this game. Like, this game is huge mm. for the Rams. They went, they were three and six last year and found a way to make it to the playoffs. If they're three and four and Cup is back on the field, knowing Sean, knowing Les Snead very well, knowing that entire organization, they're not looking to blow it up uh, at this point if they get the win. And I don't think they're going to trade them before Thursday. I mean, the division is Wide much. Open. I mean, I didn't. I went into the season thinking it would be competitive, but I never dreamed that the the Niners would be below 500 this far into the season. So well, Dave, it's interesting. At- I, I had all three of them in the playoffs. I had the Rams, the Seahawks and the Niners, but I had them all like being like 11 or 12 win teams. Instead, it's the NFC North that has those. Right. Meanwhile, you look at the NFC West, one of those teams is going to win the division and I'm including the Cardinals in this conversation. I think it's a wide open division, which almost makes it more interesting because I can see the Niners listen to the Cowboys this weekend. Oh, we'll get to that in a minute, but yeah, it, it's going to be fascinating. And one more funny parallel that I love in this game. I'm not going to say that the lions figured out Flores because you need all of that talent and scheme yeah. to do it. But it is very interesting to me that Jared Goff, who Sean McVay parted ways with stood in there against the blitz and just diced the Vikings up. And so if Jared Goff can do that, I think Sean McVay and Matthew Stafford can come up with a plan. I just, like I said, maybe, maybe people are down on this game because the Rams are two and four and they've played some ugly games, but with Cooper cup supposed to play, I'm, I'm so excited for this one, man. Yeah, no, this is going to be a great one. And it's been not, not, not often we get a Thursday night game that has real stakes to it because also if the Vikings lose suddenly it's, was that a nice cute story with Sam Darnold or are you for real? All right. You mentioned it and I was, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a little surprised to hear you say it. Sunday night football Cowboys going out to play, to play their boogeyman. Maybe I'm too close to it. I I'm not going to say they don't have a shot. But at the end of the day, I think even with everything that's going wrong for the 49ers, I trust Kyle Shanahan to have a plan for the Cowboys. I just I've I've seen this movie too many times. Yeah. Shanahan at home. Cowboys come in here. I mean, you think about all the recent matchups between these two teams and it's always get gone the Niners way. But gosh, David, I'm be honest with you. We do this for a living. We're paid to do this. And I'm not going to put you on the spot because I can't either. I don't know who's playing wide receiver for the 49ers anymore. And it's like, you know, Ayuk's out. Obviously, we have these other names that we could look at. I don't know, man. This might be right timing for the Cowboys. I'm certainly not rallying around Dallas here, but after the bye, they get a little healthier and they've got a shot. I think if, if you're a Niners fan, you're really banking on Jawan Jennings having a nice week of practice. You better like be out there. Let's go to you, our lads. Hold on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're on the computer here. Let me see here. Our lads. Do you have it's it up Joe, or no? Uh, I, I had it up while I was taking notes for this show. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I still have it up because I, I never close my tabs. All right. So Debo and Juwan are in red, which means they're injured. Ricky Persall, who was shot in August, is there. Jacob Cowing. Um, 
Uh, this is Ronnie uh, Bell. Does Ronnie, Ronnie Bell, Bell do anything for you? Ronnie Bell dropped a huge pass against the Rams. One of the worst drops you'll see in a game that cost them the game there. So yeah, I don't have a ton of confidence in a lot of this, but maybe, maybe Pearsall has a big coming out party and Melissa Stark does a good story on it because I think it's an incredible story. And we go from there. I will, I will say, and if you're a Cowboy fan, this is what you have to be banking on. I mean, they looked like a different team after their bye week last year. Like it's easy to forget. They, slogged through the first five or six weeks of the season. And I think it was, it was right before the bye that the Niners smacked them 42 to 10 last year. I just, I don't know. I, you're, you, you've got so much going on. Did you, did you happen to catch Jerry's latest comments, which I I don't think I had a chance to talk to you about Derrick Henry stuff. Well, the Derrick Henry, but also Jerry saying that, that like their coaches are designing bad yeah, plays and bad like, concepts. It's like and McCarthy's in his final year of his contract. So then if that's the case, why is he even coaching the rest of the season? I, I don't know. The, the vibes with San Francisco are bad because everybody's hurt. The vibes in Dallas are bad on, on multiple fronts. I mean, they have injuries as well. I don't know if Micah Parsons or Deron yeah, Bland is going to play. And I'll tell on, you this. It's yeah. also, there's this other factor that multiplies it and it's the same that happens here in new york giants can't win anything at home like they get in their home building and they're immediately down 20 like it's and the fans are booing and it's disgusting and then they go on the road and they're like decent last year the cowboys do not lose at home and then right. they struggle on the road this year cowboys are awful at home so the fans are like what the hell <laughs> like even when you're paying so it's it's strange. Jerry's a man of great pride and he could trot out Mike Tyson and a Paul brother and do whatever he wants and host them at Jerry World. But like when you're losing by 30 at home, that hurts. That stings. Maybe maybe the road will cure the Cowboys maybe. problems. I mean, they, but also I feel obligated to point out their road wins are against Cleveland. The Giants. Giants. They did beat Pittsburgh. It took literally every snap of the game to do it. And game the ended Steelers... at 1 11 in the morning. Yeah, yeah. I, I I don't know the I I can't buy the vibes the Cowboys are putting out right now, but I have to acknowledge it would be peak Cowboys behavior to go on the road and beat the team their fans want them to beat more than anybody after everything that's gone wrong this season. Let's wrap it up with the Tom Brady game, Buffalo Bills at Seattle Seahawks. Would you like to know, or maybe you do? Again, we've got Pro Football Reference yeah, and our lads open all the time. Do you know what Josh Allen's previous high for games without an interception is before what he's doing right now? Great question. I would say probably five games. You nailed it. Well yeah. done. That's a guess. Like, this Total is your guess. job or something. Out of, no, out of my ass. I had not seen that tweet. I have not seen that stat, but I can't imagine it being more than five games and that's stretching it even that. And here he is seven weeks in zero. You know what's funny? I, I mean, I know it's a new year. It's kind of tacky to call this a streak, but he didn't throw a pick in either playoff game last year yeah. either. So really, it's nine straight games that That's Josh great. Allen hasn't thrown an interception. He's been great. How about this? I'll give you one. Do you have any recollection at all of any other Seahawks-Bills games in your life? I have none. I couldn't think of one. Ooh. And we watch every game. I'm sure there's a great resource and there's probably some historical games, but like this is like the most random game. That is, that's a really good point. I mean, it's, it's cross conference. So yeah, I mean, you're only getting it every three or four years anyway. And it's only the Seahawks happened. were good. The bills were bad. The bills were good. The Seahawks were bad. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I have no real record. Peter did was like, okay, I'm sure they played in Buffalo not that long ago, but like, yeah. so by the current scheduling format, you're only, the bills are only playing in Seattle every like eight years. Every eight so years. are we talking about, I have no like, answer. This is probably like Legion of Boom against EJ Manuel or something right, like that. I've got I this. Had to guess. They've only played 14 times ever. They played, I guess it says here, the COVID season, November 8th, 2020. And it was a 44 to 34 win Bills over Seahawks. And then four years earlier, Seahawks won 31-25. But like, I don't reckon, I mean, I don't know any of these games. I don't have any. I'm looking back in time. Yeah. Okay. 2001 it was a 23 20 win for the seahawks yeah there's zero history between these two teams no games of significance every time you get these cross conference matchups you have this type of potential but man i having said that maybe maybe we're about to witness history because on like this looks like it could be a banger of a game and what i was gonna say too is 
I'm guessing Josh Allen is going to start throwing picks, but I think that's going to be a good thing because Amari Cooper is there now. I think you, you're going to have a little Let more. Let it rip. Ex- yeah, he's going to, there's more potential for explosives. The Bills had eight explosive pass plays against Tennessee the other day. Mm. And that's easy. That's their most of the season. So like, yeah. I think you're already seeing it in action. I think Josh Allen, I mean, we already know he's a confident guy, but I think he's going to be a little willing to say, ah, screw it. Cooper's down there somewhere. Well, let me, let me give this a shot. Keon Coleman had more receiving yards than any other player in football this week with 125. And of course he gave Amari Cooper the look like, here's how you do that route. That's the highlight. But the last time a rookie had the most receiving yards in a week was Jamar chase in 2021. So Keon is coming into his form. I also, I don't know the rules with Brady in the broadcast, but I know I, I liked listening to him talk about Mahomes. I thought he was really good Sunday, like mm-hmm. going into Mahomes and watching. And like, I feel that same way. I want to hear Brady talk about Josh Allen. I think that's cool. The first whack in the first time around with a lot of these young up and coming quarterbacks. I love hearing Brady's perspective on it. I'm interested to hear him talk about Geno Smith, who's yeah. just quietly great having an, a fantastic season. Although I think that the knock on Geno is that when the Lions or excuse me, the Seahawks have gotten into prime time, they've fallen short against the Lions, against San Francisco. Big opportunity for him to put himself on the map. I mean, the guy's got 2000 passing yards in seven games. No doubt. No doubt. Let's go, Geno. And he used to play Brady twice a year when they were with the Jets. Speaking of things that feel like they happened an eternity ago. Yeah, Decades that is ago. no doubt. That is a true story. A lot of stuff to look forward to. Hopefully no more early morning trades this week, Peter. I'll take I think... it. Dude, it beats the hell out of, you know, trying to spin. Do you, do you, all right. Oh, I love it. Love this it. is, this is behind, this is inside baseball, but like, so you prefer having the rundown yeah, nice. get messed up. Okay. Yes. Give me breaking news. Some you know people, why? Some people want to stick to a plan. ESPN's probably talking about Bronny James or the WNBA ratings. And I'm like, all right, people are watching us right now. They want to see football. So I didn't see what they did if they broke into it. But like, there's so many sports for ESPN to cover. We have football. We're going to talk Chiefs. So I knew everyone was going to toss to NFL. So like, I like that. I like when there's a, there's like, all right, let's go. There's nothing scripted. Let's just roll. All right, so we know it's not going to be Cooper Cup prior to Thursday. But with that in mind, I hope plenty more crazy shit happens. We could see it. Give you. Something to do with your morning. Peter, always love talking to you, man. We'll catch up with you soon. You're the man. Great job, Dave. Appreciate you. Thanks, as always, to Peter Schrager. Let's get to our weekly chat with our guy, Greg Olson. He's calling Buccaneers Falcons down in Tampa Bay this weekend. Crazy how high these teams were riding just a couple of weeks ago and how down the vibes feel right now. Falcons got smacked at home last weekend, 34-14 by the Seahawks. Buccaneers obviously lost not one, but two star receivers in that primetime loss to Baltimore on Monday night. Who rebounds better on Sunday at Raymond James Stadium? Had a chance to talk to Greg about it. Great conversation. Check it out. All right, Greg. It's it's only been a couple of weeks since you've seen the Buccaneers, obviously, and unfortunately, a lot changed for them almost overnight. Obviously, you know, Chris Godwin, Mike Evans go down in the Monday night game against Baltimore. I would love your perspective on this. You know, we say it a million times. I get it. It's the next man up. You got to, you know, you've got receivers that are going to step into those roles, but Mike Evans and Chris Godwin are like ring of honor type players for Tampa Bay. They've meant so much to that franchise emotionally in that locker room. How hard is it to process not having both of them. I mean, it, it sounds like Mike will be back eventually, but Chris Godwin very likely done for the year. It seems tough to move past from an emotional standpoint, even if new guys have to step into those roles. Yeah, I mean, obviously the, the immediate impact is felt on the field, right? Those guys aren't standing in the huddle. You know, Mike for a couple of weeks, it seems like the, the reports are he'll be back after the buy in like week 12, maybe. So they got a, they got a ways to go there. And then obviously Chris Godwin will be out for the season. That was hard to watch. So the, the immediate impact obviously will be felt on the field, not seeing those guys in the huddle. Th- there's a huge impact, but really it's a psychological impact. You know, all week now, guys are still wrapping their heads around not only losing one of them, but now you lose arguably your best two players on the entire team. Um, guys that have been playing at a high level for a really long time in Buccaneers uniforms and you lose them both in the same game. 
Um, you know, and then to make matters worse, the, the it's never easy to lose a player, whether it's the first play of the game or the last play of the game. The manner in which they lost uh, Chris Godwin is is unfortunate. Game coming down to the end. They're still trying to fight to give themselves any glimmer of hope to come back. And um, just kind of a weird t- tackle got dragged down from behind and obviously took suffered a pretty significant injury. So there, there's a there's a multitude of different levels of impact here on the field in the locker room in the huddle psychological um it's going to be a big hurdle for them to bounce back and and overcome those two guys mean a lot to that team not just in the box score i'm sure i've asked you this before over the time that we've done this but i'm so interested by it like over over your playing career is there a tip is there a method for compartmentalizing that type of stuff? I mean, do you just do you just need reps dealing with life in the NFL? I mean, do you have any advice for for a team or a player trying to deal with these sorts of things? You know, it's hard. You never want to completely desensitize yourself to that these guys are human beings, right? These are your teammates. These are your buddies. This is their livelihood that they, you know, are putting, you know, at, at risk every time they step onto the field and you know, there is an element to sometimes we lose the humanity of the game and we just look at guys as numbers and as pawns in this larger matchup. But when, when you boil it all down, the, the unfortunate reality is all these guys that sign up for football understand what they're signing up for. Um, there is an inherent risk of injury. It could happen after 10 years of playing or it could happen in your very first ever NFL game. There's really no way to predict it. And um, it's hard, but you really it sounds cliche, but you really don't have a choice. The game is going to be played, whether or not you're prepared mentally and physically to go out there, the game is going to move on regardless of what happened to you the week before. It does not stop for teams with injuries. It does not feel bad for teams going through ups and downs. It just, that's kind of the, the, the reality that all football players and all coaches live with is finding that balance between understanding who these guys are as people and as individuals and the humanity of it, but also understanding the show must go on and with or without you, the game is going to go on. So these guys have a, have a big test this week. It's a division opponent. They just lost an absolute heartbreaker to them in a really good game a few weeks back. And um, now they got a shot to host them at home. So obviously you don't want to fall 2-0, to a team in your division, especially in what looks like it's going to be a two-man race down the stretch in the NFC South between Atlanta and Tampa. So this is a huge game. Um, have to at a minimum split to try to keep some of those tiebreakers alive, um, you know, come the end of the season. Along those lines, and I'll, saying one more time, a huge, huge loss. I feel terrible for those guys. They're such fun players too. Tell me if you think I'm crazy, though, that I think the bird fairly well equipped to try to deal with this. I mean, we saw Kate Otten is putting together a really nice season. He had a hundred yards against Baltimore. They've kind of discovered this trio of running backs. You saw, you know, them break out against the saints when you did their game a couple week ago, weeks ago. And then, you know, Trey Palmer and Jalen McMillan are at least young receivers that you're probably intrigued to see more of. Are you buying what I'm selling at all here? Like this feels like uh, when you're going to lose your two best skill players, it feels like they at least have options to try to to replace that. I, I think it's fair. You know, I, I think you're never going to replace two guys of that caliber, let alone in five days. So that that's that's clear. But no, I, I don't disagree. I think the run game has to continue to be a larger element to this offense, right? Leading up until this point, it was quick underneath passing, a lot of explosive plays from catches short of the sticks that they, you know, would obviously add Yak to the end of that, Chris Godwin towards the top of the league in, in that category. And then it's really been the evolution of the run game that for the last handful of years, the run game at Tampa was pretty non-existent. It was a pass heavy offense, whether it was with Tom or then since Baker took over last year, the run game was very secondary, both in importance and in efficiency. That's starting to slowly change. Their 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 season, you know, production and efficiency with the three backs you mentioned has really greatly improved. Their offensive line play has greatly improved. They've got a little healthy, getting get a key back at right tackle. So they they're they're feeling better that they don't have to put the whole game on Baker Mayfield's back. But with that said, it's hard to just completely turn around your approach in one week and for a team that was so heavily dependent on the passing game, although we've seen elements kind of transitioning to a little bit more balance, 
I think they're going to continue to have that pendulum swing towards a balanced approach, lean on some of those backs, lean on K. Dotton, lean on Jalen McMillan, the rookie receiver. Like they're they got to find production and the ability to sustain drives and generate explosives from someone. Um, is it a lot easier throwing deep balls to Mike Evans and throwing <laughs> underneath passes to Chris Godman for run after catch? Yes, but I think Liam Cohen is a really good offensive coordinator. He has a very good relationship and understanding with Baker Mayfield playing to his strengths and protecting some of the weaknesses of the offense. And your job in the NFL is not always to be dealt the best hand, but you got to make the make best of what hand you are dealt. And um, that's the challenge for them this week. And, and it comes against a team that they have a lot of familiarity with. Yeah, doing it on a short week, maybe not ideal, but I am intrigued to see where that goes on the flip side, on the Atlanta side of this, Beside the point, because we're not talking about the Seahawks, but watching that Atlanta-Seattle game back, Geno Smith had about as fun of a day as anybody in the NFL outside of maybe Lamar Jackson and, and Jared Goff. Atlanta's secondary seems like they've been playing pretty well this season, especially without much of a pass rush. But, I mean, it, is it too simple to say that that – we we've seen a blueprint on how you can get the better of them. Just the way Geno Smith was, was kind of dicing them up. Yeah. I'm, you know, I don't want to say a surprise because nothing really surprises you in the NFL any given week that storylines can change and strengths can become weaknesses and vice versa. I think from a past standpoint, it does start with the case that they thought they were going to address their pass rush issues. They make the trade for, for Judon. They get Grady Jarrett back from injury after losing him last year. And, and they thought that there would just be a, an improvement in the ability to, you know, impact quarterbacks, get the ball out of their hand, not let them go through progressions and get deep into their, you know, to their options downfield. And there was some slight improvement defending the pass, not so much rushing the passer. I think AJ Terrell is a really good um, corner in this league got paid like one his play has continued they went out and they signed Justin Simmons who had been playing really well and then last week a lot of the numbers had to break down before the half for the long DK Metcalf touchdown um, had some coverage issues some coverage breakdowns that he was the first to admit after the game hey that falls on me I need to be better so there was some issues there defending the pass Gino had a great game and listen we this you just go back a couple weeks ago when these guys played both Baker and and Kirk Cousins had fantastic days. It was a right. shootout. It felt like the guy who had the ball last was going to win. And that's in essence what happened with, with Kirk coming up with the plays there at the end to, to win on the walk-off. So it, it feels like a game that Atlanta wants to recreate from an offensive side of the ball. And then defensively, they have to say, okay, can we keep this from being a runaway shootout with the team we're playing losing their best two options, right? So I think there has to be a little bit of a confidence grab if you're this secondary saying, all right, let's bounce back from a tough week. We get to do it against a depleted offensive skill positions. It might look a little different from what Tampa tries to employ against us. But listen, the reality is if you're Atlanta and you know you have to defend the Bucs with Mike Evans and with Chris Godwin or without, as much as these guys hate to see injuries and you don't ever want to see things happen from a football standpoint, it's a lot easier of a task to defend these guys without those two players than, than, than with. On the flip side of that, it, it's so interesting that these two teams just played. And I mean, the Buccaneers got plenty of pressure on Kirk cousins and it did not matter. He had a phenomenal game. He threw for 500 yards. Then on Sunday against Seattle, it kind of looked like Seattle's pressure bothered him. And it just looked like Atlanta's passing game was off. I mean, is that just, Hey, we're, you know, this is a, a once a week game with a high degree of variance and sometimes you're going to succeed and sometimes you're not, or is there, is there something more to that? Cause even, even knowing that Kirk played so well against Tampa the other week, I'm still doing everything and I, everything in my power to try to pressure him. Cause it looked like it worked for Seattle. Yeah. And, and listen, no team other than Minnesota, who we saw last week, no team likes to get after the quarterback via blitz more than Todd Bowles and more than the Bucks this year. I mean, over half of their defensive snaps are some sort of pressure, some sort of blitz package. So they're going to try to create that. Now, their pressure isn't always, their blitz isn't always resulting in consistent pressure, which I think does stress some of their back end. Remember, when they played Atlanta a couple weeks ago in that shootout, so much of the damage was done just under 400 yards. It was like 370-something yards that Cousins of the 500 
was in the middle of the field. He did most of his damage against the linebackers and the safeties. Antoine Winfield didn't play. They had some injuries, so they were kind of changing some of their coverages. Since he's gotten back in the lineup for Tampa, their defense, you know, targeting him, his ability to patrol the middle of the field, both in the deep secondary and also up around the box, has improved. He's, you know, he's obviously a top player in this league. So it'll, again, it will look a little different. Todd Bowles is a fantastic coach. He's not going to say, okay, Kirk Cousins, throw for 400 in the middle of the field again. He's going to change things up. But listen, if you're Tampa, your blitz has to get home. You have to move. You either have to get the ball out of his, out of Cousins' hand fast or you got to move him off his spot. Because when he is comfortable in the pocket, playing in rhythm, working through his progressions un, you know, unhindered, he is deadly accurate and he's going to continue to make big plays. I mean, he's done it his entire career. You have to disrupt him. You have to get your pressure there. And if your blitz doesn't get there, he's going to find holes in your secondary because you're a zone or two short. So it, it all goes hand in hand. It all starts with the front. It all starts with the pressure package. And, um, you know, listen, we, Todd Bowles has been doing this for a long time. He's going to have a great plan. Um, and, you know, we'll see uh, We'll see what adjustments they make because the last time they went against this Cousins-led offense, um, it was about as good a performance we've seen from the quarterback position all year. I don't know if we can hope for that again, but I hope this game is is half as good as that Thursday night one turned into. Agreed. Agreed. Looking forward to it, man. It's always fun talking to you. I'll uh, I'll chat with you on the other side, but a, a big, big game in the NFC South for sure. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. You got it. Let's take it to another big week eight matchup in the NFC, and it is a homecoming for Caleb Williams going back to his hometown of Washington, D.C. and the DMV area. But in order to go home... He has to go on the road. It's a perfect game for on the road presented by Honda. Dreams are unstoppable. Storylines tremendous in Bears at Commanders. Caleb Williams, like I said, going back to D.C. to face his hometown team. And the number two overall pick in the draft, who to this point in the season has upstaged him a little bit. Or at least we hope that is the storyline come Sunday. That is the cruelty of football. The NFL saw this weeks ago. They had the wherewithal to flex it into a later window. Bigger audience, more people to watch the number one and number two pick, Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels, go at it, both leading their teams to su surprising success. And of course, Jaden's availabil availability is now in question after suffering that rib injury against Carolina. It's never quite as straightforward as you want it to be. Sounds like it's going to be a waiting game. We record these episodes on Wednesday evening. Daniels did not practice Wednesday, so for the time being, we're just waiting to see. I think based on what we know, this could be a decision. It'll certainly go up until Friday. It might even go until Sunday before the game. Marcus Mariota stepped in admirably for Jaden in that big win against Carolina last week. So I don't think there's any pressure to rush Jaden Daniels into this game if he's not ready. But for the time being, we just wait to see if that is a possibility. Man, it would be fun. Washington sits on top of the NFC East, and it's not the cute kind of first place like after week one or week two where you're just happy to have a win under your belt. We're at week eight. We have reached roughly the halfway point of the season first place in the NFC East a very real five and two record a very real chance to stay that way as they begin to work through the division schedule based on what we've seen from Philadelphia and Dallas not quite as sexy for the Bears they are four and two thanks to the strength of the NFC North that that is good enough for last place. That's not completely fair to be looking up at the Lions, Vikings, and Packers in the standings, but a huge opportunity to make some noise this weekend and actually a huge throwback opportunity. It sounds weird to say in 2024, these are two proud NFC franchises. I loved this stat from Kevin Fishbane of The Athletic. This is the first time the Bears and Commanders, the Bears and the team based in Washington, D.C., have played each other when both teams were above 500. First time since 1991. Been a long, long time since both of these teams 
we're having a fun season at the same time. It's also a huge milestone for the winner. I'm not trying to hate. I'm guessing you've seen this bouncing around social media or other NFL podcasts. Neither one of these teams has a win against a team with a winning record. I know it's not college football. It's not about style points. You play who's in front of you. But I do think it's good context to know the combined record of the Bears' four wins is just 7-20. and 20. The combined record of the Commanders' five wins is just 10-25. and 25. Commanders, very competitive against the mighty Baltimore Ravens recently. Not to say that they're not a good team, but a win for either squad would just suggest a, a capability at a higher caliber of win. Hopefully, it's all at full strength. If we assume he can play what a matchup this is. And I honestly, we know what these offenses can do. We know what Jaden Daniels can do. And Caleb Williams certainly rounding into form before the bye week. I'm curious about the defenses. Chicago, top 10 defense by DVOA. Washington, all the way down at 23. But I think it's worth pointing out, Washington's offense is a top three group by DVOA. Bears offense, all the way down at 25, so a much steeper test for the Bears' defense than a lot of the opponents they've had, whereas Chicago's offense may be a little bit less of a challenge for Washington's group. I guess we'll see. Daniel's injury is going to take all the headlines. I think it's worth noting, too, though, that as we record this, Bears do everything safety Jaquan Brisker, as well as nickelback Kyler Gordon, aren't practicing yet either. Could change by the end of the week. It's something to monitor, but... I like this matchup a little bit less for the Bears if those guys are not available. I do think the Bears have the horses in the secondary to limit Washington's passing attack. I think they, you know, they they can take receivers away, they can press receivers, disrupt the timing. Jaden Daniels, if he plays, is all about getting the ball out of his hand quickly. I think Washington or excuse me, I think Chicago can disrupt that a little bit, maybe make it a little bit clunkier in the passing attack for Washington bears second best success rate against the pass in the NFL, just four passing touchdowns allowed in six games. So a steeper test for Jaden Daniels than he's seen in a lot of these matchups. I'd love to pick it if I was more confident, but you're not going to catch me in that trap. Not until I know if Jaden Daniels is going to play or not. All I can say is I hope he's feeling healthy. I hope he does. Cause if both of these young quarterbacks are available, what a matchup, what must-see TV at FedEx Field on Sunday. And it's not often we've said that in the last 25 years. We talked about division rematches in the NFC South with Greg Olson. We got another one in the AFC South, the Houston Texans and Indianapolis Colts rematching their week one game down in Houston. Sneaky game right here just because I think with the way each team's season is gone, I don't know if everybody is aware that the Colts can tie for the division lead with a win against Houston. Houston on top of the division right now at five and two, but Indy's lurking right there at four and three, despite all the changes at quarterback and everything else that's gone on with them this season. A win out of first place, not a bad spot to be. To preview this one, who better to talk to than our own Ben Arthur, Fox Sports reporter. Ben, how we doing, man? Doing well, Dave. How are you? I'm doing great, and I need you to calm me down because the issue of the week, I, I see it everywhere. I'm trying not to be worried about it, but I've seen a lot of talk about the Houston offensive line, and you are my Houston Texans expert. Can, can you give me any reason for optimism after the performance we saw against Green Bay? Should people be concerned? about this Texans offensive line that has has given up quite a bit of pressure here in, in recent weeks. It is it's definitely concerning and and you look at the talent they have up front uh and what they did last year they were a very successful pass protecting unit last year it's essentially the same group uh this season and and you you mentioned the pressures they've allowed uh the defending uh, the pass rush has been an issue. And then just from an execution standpoint, penalties have been a really big issue. I know Laramie Tunsil is near the top of the league in terms of uh, penalties um, against him. And, and I believe overall as an offense, they're top three 
in the NFL in 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 penalties. And so execution up front has been lacking. And it's kind of hard to pinpoint uh why exactly that's happening. As I said, it's it's like the same unit as uh the previous year. I think if you're the Texans and if you're Bobby Slovic, this offensive coordinator, you have to lean on uh continue to lean on the run game, what has worked. And and I, I think we've we've seen how offensive linemen can re- really build confidence um you know when they're run blocking when you know they're able to maul uh defenders in the run game and that has worked for them Joe Mixon is back healthy and they they've been able to to really get the ground game going and, and we've seen that his productivity has really been key uh for this offense so I, I think if you can continue to lean on him uh let this offensive line continue to build confidence through the run game and then um, in, in time that can open up shots for um, not only give C.J. Stroud time, but open up shots for these receivers, these weapons we know this offense has. Joe Mixon was just about the only thing going for the Texans last week when they lost to the Packers 125 and a couple of touchdowns. I hate to say the Colts present a get right opportunity because they're above 500. They, they, you know, they've found ways to win games. The spread is it's only five points in favor of Houston at home, but this Colts defense has looked leaky at times in, I mean, across the board, but against the run as well. I mean, they lead the league in explosive plays allowed on the ground. This seems like a chance for Houston to refine its mojo and, yeah, like I said, I, I'm not worried coming off of the Green Bay game, but if the if the Texans can at least find some consistent success here, that seems like a much bigger issue with what we've seen from the Colts. Yeah, absolutely. I mean the the uh, the Colts are number they're 31st in in run defense. I mean they've given up a ton of yards on the ground. We talked about Joe Mix and the success Houston has had running the ball. That's definitely something that they're going to want to lean on. And that's what worked for them in the season opener, right? That's when Joe Mixon ran for over 160 on the ground. And so I, I know that that's going to be something that they want to focus on. But but also the, the Colts are going to know that they're going to want to to run the ball too. So, so the Texans are going to have to figure it out, uh, whether it's doing doing more chipping, kind of max protection, whatever it is. Uh, to make sure uh, C.J. Stroud has enough time to get these uh, guys the the ball. And so I, I think from the Texans standpoint, you, you are a little encouraged because as much depth as the Colts do have on paper on the D-line, and, and I know DeForest Buckner is still on IR, uh, that they haven't been that pre- that type of pass rush unit, that pressure team that a lot of people thought uh, would be that they would be entering the year like they're closer to the bottom of the league in, in pressure rate. So, I mean, this could I mean, we know the, the, the run game numbers are what it is. Uh, the Texans being good at running the ball, the the Colts not being so good at, at defending it. But I think uh, you, you look at the pass rush numbers for the Colts so far this year, it hasn't been that great. So um, I, I think if you're this Texans offense, that that is some reason reason to be confident as well. We're on the other side, man. It feels it feels like several lifetimes ago that Anthony Richardson had that sixty five yard throw in the season opener, and you know he he looked so promising in that loss to Houston to open the season. I'm I'm still I'm waiting to figure out what the Colts are because obviously Richardson hasn't played a lot this season. Joe Flacco replaced him for a few weeks. The whole Colts operation was a struggle against the Dolphins last week, but. That is a really strong defensive unit that they were going against. I guess where I am with with them in general is I'm just putting a pin in it. It seems like a lot of people are are freaking out about Anthony Richardson a little bit. This would be just the 10th start of his NFL career. I, I, I feel like people are jumping the gun. This is what was supposed to happen. He's a guy that needs a lot of development. And and that's not always going to be pretty. Am, am I on the right track there? I mean, not to say that the Colts don't have a chance of moving the ball against Houston. They already did it in the first game of this series, but this is going to take some time. And I'm just I'm not in a rush to jump to conclusions about this. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Dave. This is what we all expected when he was entering the NFL. 
the whole accuracy concerns, the not having enough starts under his belt. Um, he, he did have some injuries he, he battled with uh, when he was in college at, at Florida, even in, in high school too. So his experience level entering the NFL was very low. And then we have to remember, like, you mentioned that this is only going to be his 10th start, but he really, he missed a big opportunity for development this past off season because most of it was spent rehabbing the shoulder injury that ended his rookie season. And so he has missed so much development time, uh, not only to start his NFL career, but also even b- before his NFL career that frankly, he he's kind of where you, you think a guy uh, where that, that he should be at considering the, the significant lack of experience and, and reps to this point. That doesn't mean the Colts aren't doing everything they can to simplify the game for him and, and making sure you get those designed runs in there for him to, to kind of build his confidence. And a, a positive note for the Colts being that Jonathan Taylor, as of uh, the day we're recording, he returned to practice after missing eight straight practices. So you have a really a good chance of getting him back against Houston. And so, um, but it, as far as Anthony Richardson goes, yeah, this is kind of where I, I expected him to, to be at this point. This jury is still kind of out about what he can be, just nine starts under his belt to this point. Yeah, I have a feeling getting Jonathan Taylor back, if they are able to do that, would go a long way toward making this offense more enjoyable. Honestly, as we talk through it, I haven't, really enjoyed watching the Colts play football much this season, but we're less than halfway through the season. They've dealt with quarterback injuries. They are developing a very raw quarterback when he is healthy and they're above 500 with a chance to tie for the division lead this weekend against the division rivals. So with all that stuff in mind, I think in the big picture, they're, they're in a pretty solid place. It'll be interesting to see how they do against a team that even even with the struggles, I still view Houston as a contender. So good test for them. I wanted to pick your brain on another big AFC South matchup. The Jags hosting the Green Bay Packers. I'm not going to get ahead of myself with Jacksonville. Like they they had a really nice day in London to beat the Patriots. Finally, it, it good for them. It, top five efficiency across the board on offense, passing, rushing. They even had a special teams touchdown. What are the odds that we think that can translate against what is pretty obviously a, a really good Packers team? Yeah, um, I'm I'm not so sure about about that one. I, I mean, the Packers legitimately. <laughs> just being honest with you, Dave. I mean, I, the no, I, that's what we need here. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, the Packers legitimately look like one of the best best teams in the NFL, but certainly in the NFC. I know that they did turn the ball over a few times against Houston last week, but top to bottom, this is a, a really strong roster. Uh, one with experience now, too, as young as they are, I think three-fourths of their roster is 25 years old or, or younger, but they, they have uh, the experience from last year, and, and Jordan Love has kind of gotten back into his groove a little bit. And so this is going to be a really tough task uh, for Jacksonville, but uh, but I mean, you, you never know. I mean, the NFL, as we all know, is kind of a, a week-to-week league. And, and for the Jags, I think seeing, we kind of un- underestimate sometimes how big seeing success can be for a team. And look, they, they have some uh, some great young talent. We obviously know how quickly Brian Thomas Jr. is becoming a wide receiver one in this league. We were talking about Tank Bigsby uh, b- beforehand. Um, that this this team doesn't it's not like they don't have talent like that the talent is there I think the coaching hasn't been where it, it should be at times but like this is a team that can make uh, that, that they can make the Packers sweat uh, for sure but um, that they just haven't done it consistently and and beating a Patriots team that's uh, really bad and has a lot of issues and Gerard Mayo is calling them soft I mean they have a lot of issues o- over there and so I, I think the Packers are just kind of in a better place uh, right now, but, um, but yeah, so uh, I, I don't, I don't really look at the Jags as a, a legitimate uh, threat in this one, but, but again, I mean, just because they've, you know, coming back to the States, having some confidence now, um, maybe that makes this one a little bit interesting. Crazier things have happened. It's been a very topsy turvy season already. 
I, I'm just, I'm putting the Jags off to the side. I've got an eyebrow raised. Uh, if, if this one is competitive in the second half, I will rush to that TV to see what's going on. But I need to see a little bit more from Jacksonville after the way the season has started. Four point underdog at home against Green Bay. We'll see how all the action goes in the AFC South. Always love talking to you, Ben. I'll catch up with you soon, man. Sounds good. Appreciate you, Dave. Up next, it's time for the Super Six presented by DraftKings. Every week we help you play the Super Six. If you're unfamiliar, run over to foxsports.com or the Fox Sports app. It's the Super Six sponsored by DraftKings. If you're unfamiliar, every week they give you six prompts, six bets. Sometimes it's a, a game. Sometimes it's yardage prompts, touchdowns, six different picks. You make those picks. If you hit all six of them, you can win big. It's a really fun way to follow along with all the action on a Sunday. It gives you a reason to be invested in a lot of different stuff. And every week, I try to help you out with a prompt. I'm just going to go ahead and say this week was tough. I went with which player is likely to finish with the most rushing yardage in week eight. Tough choices. It's Detroit's Jameer Gibbs against the Tennessee Titans. Arizona's James Conner at the Miami Dolphins, Atlanta's Bijan Robinson at the Tampa Bay Bucks, and Seattle's Kenneth Walker III versus the Buffalo Bills. I don't love my choices here, to be honest with you. All four of these guys are going against quality run defenses. James Conner had a great week last week, but he's going against the top five run defense. Seattle's going against the top 10 run defense in Buffalo, plus Kenny Walker splits carries with Zach Charbonnet. In Tampa, Vita Vea and Kalijah Cancy are back, so that makes it tough on Bijan Robinson. Plus, he splits carries with Tyler Algier. And, of course, Jameer Gibbs splits time with David Montgomery. And, ignore the record, Tennessee's run defense, also very, very nice. Don't love my options, but I am going to go with Jameer Gibbs. Maybe that sounds counterintuitive, but I'll tell you why I don't think so. Of all of these matchups... I'm most confident in the Lions to win. And I'm most confident in the Lions to have a lead in the second half where you can lean on a running game. Some of these other matchups might be shootouts. We saw what Atlanta and Tampa did the last time they played, 36 to 30. Seattle and Buffalo both have really fun, explosive passing attacks. I trust Detroit to be running the ball in the second half of this game. And David Montgomery suffered that knee injury against Minnesota. It sounds like he's going to play, but if Detroit has the lead against the team that they're favored to beat, I trust or at least hope Dan Campbell's going to get David Montgomery out of there and let Jameer Gibbs do the heavy lifting. He had 116 yards last week. Like I said, it's dicey. Don't love any of my choices, but I'm going to roll with Jameer Gibbs. Feel good about it. That is my pick for the Super Six. That just about does it for the week eight preview. One last thing to get to, though, and that would be our hurry up offense. Still seven games that we have not touched on in this preview episode. We are committed to the bit. We're going to give you something on every single matchup in the NFL this week. And there's no there's no bye weeks this week. They like to do that. They jump back to 16 games after giving out a few bye weeks in the early going. I guess we'll be back to having buys in week nine. Yeah, the Steelers and the 49ers take week nine off. But here in week eight, everybody's playing. So we've still got seven matchups to get to. I'll try to tighten it up. If you're new to the show, this is the spiel. We go through as quickly as possible. My producers are about to give me two minutes on the clock to say something interesting about every matchup that we haven't touched on yet. And there are some good ones left. No disrespect to these games. There's just only so many minutes in a show. But we have two minutes to do this. I think I can do it. Let's start with the Eagles at the Bengals. Crazy stat. Jamar Chase leads the NFL with 620 receiving yards. He is the fourth receiver in history to tally 600-plus yards and six or more touchdowns in the first seven games in three different years. Three different years he's done that well. The only other three guys to do that are Jerry Rice, Randy Moss, Terrell Owens. Insane company for Jamar Chase as the Eagles travel to take on the Bengals. Ravens at Browns. Jameis Winston expected to get the start in place of Deshaun Watson, who ruptured his Achilles. Winston will be the 39th Browns starter since they re-entered the league in 1999. That leads second place Chicago by a full nine QBs. Cardinals at Dolphins. 
I'm not committing to it, but to hear it from Tyree Kill, it sounds like Tua Tungavailoa is back. He told reporters, quote, we're back, baby. Strike up the effing band. So we'll see how that goes. Interesting note on the Cardinals. All four of their losses have come to teams that currently have a 5-2 and two or better record. So quality losses, right? We'll see what the Cardinals can do down in Miami. Jets at Pats. Opportunity for the Jets to sweep New England for the first time since the year 2000. Maybe a little extra motivation to keep your season alive. Saints at Chargers. Since the last time we recorded, Alvin Kamara signed a two-year extension. He had seven touchdowns this season. The entire Chargers as a whole, the whole team, they have nine. That game happening at SoFi Stadium. Panthers at Broncos. Bryce Young expected to get the start in place of Andy Dalton. Dalton was in a car accident this week. Young has not thrown a touchdown pass in six straight road starts. This game is in Denver. Does not bode well for Carolina. And last but not least, Monday Night Football, Giants at Steelers. Daniel Jones 0-5 in career starts against top five scoring defenses five weeks or later into the season. You guessed it as the buzzer goes off. Pittsburgh currently second in the league in scoring defense. I don't like that stat for Danny Dimes. That does it for the show. That does it for the hurry up offense. If I'm if I'm on my last thought when the buzzer goes off, I count that as a win. So kudos to me for getting through a full 16 game slate. No bye weeks wall-to-wall football, and we will be here on Sunday to cover every bit of it. Check your feeds on Monday. We'll be back to break down everything from Seahawks Bills to the Cowboys Niner game on Sunday night. So much to get to. We will have insight analysis from Fox Sports personalities, from the guys commenting the games. So much to get to. As always, I'm looking forward to it. Make sure you're subscribed so you get it on Monday morning. Spotify, Apple Podcast. You can find us on social at NFL on Fox Pod. Looking forward to another full weekend of NFL football, and we will talk to you all on Monday.